Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim from San Jose Bible Baptist Church. So resuming our verse-by-verse -verse study in Revelation, and again, I apologize for not showing the whiteboard, or if my delivery is not that strong, it's because I'm still recovering. Let's return to Revelation chapter 14. We left off at verse 6 through 8. Uh, we read concerning Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, about the everlasting gospel being preached. Now remember, that's a different gospel from Paul's gospel preached, which he called it my gospel at the book of Galatians. Now there are some critics who try to criticize this teaching about different gospels, which is also called dispensational gospels, it's from the teaching of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism meaning that not all verses in the Bible are going to be all in the same time period or one in the same thing. It's going to divide into different time periods, different groups of people. Verses are divided. So the proof text that they will use is the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, to try to disprove the idea of different gospels or dispensational gospels. Notice over here, Paul says at Galatians 1 verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So, some anti-dispensationalists, they'll say that I'm damned, and they'll say, damn me forever, believe it or not. There are some people who do that and have an agenda against me and some Bible-believing preachers. And this is the verse that they'll use to justify it, saying that I'm accursed or I'm damned. However, you'll notice from this passage it says, if an angel of heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. That's Paul's gospel. Now, wait a minute. Didn't the angel at Revelation 14 preach a different gospel? We already looked at that. He did. You'll notice that the gospel is fearing God and keeping his commandments. So notice over here, fear God and worship him, right? It says right here that the everlasting gospel at verse 6 is verse 7, fear God and worship him. And then you'll notice that has to do with commandments at verse 12. So that is totally different from Paul's gospel, because look at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's gospel is definitely the total opposite. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, verse 2, by which ye are saved. What is it? Fearing God. Worship Him. Commandments? No. Look at verse 3. Christ died for our sins. Verse 4, he was buried and he rose again the third day. You don't see that anywhere at Revelation 14. So what do you mean that I'm accursed? There's a different gospel. So then, is that angel accursed according to Galatians 1? When we looked at Revelation 14, it says if an angel from heaven preach any other gospel... Well, we saw that at Revelation 14, but in Revelation 14, we saw that this is not a bad angel. This is an angel that the Lord used to preach to the world. Well, what's the explanation here? It's very simple. Notice over here that Galatians chapter 1, that this is the time period of the church. This is during Paul, who's an apostle to the churches of Galatia. This is the church age. So this time period has to be separated from the time period of Revelation.
Do you know what even the book of Revelation means? That's a time period where Jesus reveals himself for the end. So let's look at Revelation chapter 1 really quickly. So there's no doubt that there's a distinction of time periods. Look at right here. The revelation of Jesus Christ for what? Which must shortly come to pass. See that? This is a future time period. It's the end times. Notice over here, verse 3, it's what? Prophecy. The time is at hand. That's all end times. Future tribulation. Not only that, if we're going to insist that Galatians chapter 1, if the critics want to say, well, there's only one gospel, there's no such thing as dispensational or different gospels, they didn't even read their own proof text. Notice that verse 7, okay, so first of all, verse 6, Paul says, I'm amazed that someone called you away from my gospel to a different gospel, right? But look at the colon. And then verse 7, it says, which is not another. Wait a minute. So Paul then recognizes over here at verse 7 that there is another gospel, another legitimate gospel. But at verse 6 and 7, he's trying to argue here that there is no another legitimate gospel that his critics were proclaiming that attacked Paul's gospel of grace. See that? So notice over here that he was saying that the critics' gospel is not even another legitimate gospel. That's the point of Paul's preaching. So in verse 7, Paul recognizes that there is a, another legitimate gospel. But he's trying to debunk the critics over here, pointing out that even the critics don't have an, another legitimate gospel. But if we are to continually look at this context, you'll notice over here at verse 11, Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is what? Is not after man. Notice over here that Paul says that the gospel that he preached was not taught at all by any other people. Especially at verse 12, you'll notice right here, he never even received it from the apostles or from the people before him. He wasn't even taught that. How about that? So this gospel that Paul is preaching, then, is a totally new, different gospel. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus Christ preach the gospel of the kingdom at Matthew chapter 4? So isn't Paul preaching a different gospel then? Why? Because it's at a time period. Paul's at a time period of the church, which is different from Jesus Christ, who did not even die on the cross yet. Before he died on the cross, he was at an Old Testament time period. That's why Jesus Christ was preaching a different gospel. See that? Why? Because he was at a different time period. So when people are trying to use Galatians 1 on you that this denies different gospels or dispensational gospel, simply say this. I can simply say, yeah, I agree, Galatians chapter 1, that if I am to preach a different gospel for the time period of the church for people to get saved. So if I preach Revelation 14, as the gospel for today, that's wickedness. If I preach the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached at Matthew 4 for today, that's wickedness. But you notice different cults are doing that. They're combining Matthew 4 gospel and Revelation 14 gospel with Paul's gospel of Galatians 1. You know what that is? That should be accursed. So then, actually, this is talking about the anti-dispensationalists anti-dispensationalists who are trying to combine the Gospels of Revelation 14, Matthew 4, with Galatians 1, they're supposed to be a curse, not me. How about that? So, uh, be careful what you say, because you're probably speaking about yourself. So, what we proclaim is, yeah, if anybody preaches a Gospel besides Galatians 1, 
during the time of the church, then they're supposed to be accursed. That's why the time of the church, when it's over, there's a different gospel preached called the everlasting gospel, and the church cannot be at that timeline. They have to be separated to a different time period. This is why you have to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, where the church is raptured before the tribulation, and the church cannot be in the tribulation. If you do, then you're going to be accursed over here. If you combine the Galatians 1 gospel of the church with the Revelation 14 gospel, that's supposed to be for Gentiles in the tribulation. Okay, let's return to our main text over here. Now, you'll notice at verse 9, the third angel followed them. Okay, remember, there were two angels before. Verse 8, the angel that declared the fall of Babylon. And verse 6, the angel that preached about the everlasting gospel. So notice that at verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, so he proclaims with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, so if anybody worships the beast, who is the Antichrist, and his image, which is his idol, which we talked about, and that could be something virtual as well, and receive his mark in his forehead. So if they take that 666 mark in their forehead, or in his hand, or if they put it in their right hand, what's going to happen to them? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That same individual is going to taste God's wrath, which is hell. So it's using a metaphor metaphorical phrase, drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Okay, so then that wine, so that drink is poured into that cup but just like wine you'll notice over here when it's talking about the wine though it has no mixture so usually sometimes people would like to mix drinks for that wine but over here it's without mixture why because it's going to be purely of his wrath that's what they're going to do into the cup of his indignation so God's wrath is all over in there, cup of his indignation, his anger. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. That same individual who tastes God's wrath, that wrath is going to be a torment of fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. So it's going to be at the presence of God's angels that he's going to be burning with fire and then brimstone. I mentioned before about uh, brimstone, where it could be possible that could be referring to stones of fire, etc. But more so, actually, it's actually referring to sulfur. But then there are some interesting things concerned about stones of fire with brimstone that you can do some research on. I'm sure you'll find some interesting things. Aside from that, they're not only tormented in the fire at the presence of the angels, but in the presence of Jesus Christ and in the presence of the Lamb. So remember, Jesus is also called the Lamb. Now then, this means that there is an eternal hell fire for those who receive the mark of the Antichrist. Wait, does that mean that there is no such thing as annihilation in hell but eternal torment? Yes, I don't believe it, you might say. Well, look at verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Look at this. This smoke comes out of this hell fire, which is called God's wrath, and it goes up, ascends up, how long? Forever and ever. Well, it's just the fire that goes up forever. No, because it says torment goes up forever and ever. Notice right here, and they have no rest day nor night. So these people... 24-7 are not in peace or in rest. They're not deceased. They're what? Tormented. And for people who believe in what a uh, decease or soul sleep, you'll notice over here there's no such thing. There's no rest and they're burning forever. 
who worship the beast and his image, the people who worship the Antichrist and his idol. They're going to be burning forever. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, anybody who receives his mark. Now, notice, interestingly, it says the mark of his name. So his name could actually be the mark over there. And then we talked about where the Antichrist had the name of blasphemy, right? And then I mentioned the possibility could be Vicarious Philly Day, which the Pope wears on his crown. And if you cross out those uh, capital letters, which do not match with Roman numerals, and then you keep the remaining capital letters, which are Roman numerals, which can be numbers, it's going to be 666. Now, I've heard some rumors where the Pope crossed out that thing from his crown. Now, a long time ago, they actually did that. But supposedly, even more recently, the Pope did that, which I haven't really looked into. But you can see over here that the Antichrist is trying to hide his identity more and more. And this shows, more interestingly, that the Pope, I see it more connected to the Antichrist, and only something demonic would want to try to hide that. So that's why I kind of don't favor where um, people try to deny the Pope being the Antichrist. Because I see this more as Satan trying to hide that identity. So you'll notice over here that in these two verses that this has to be eternal hellfire. Eternal hellfire. For people who don't believe in that, I mean, Revelation 14 is utmost proof, but let's look at several other passages. Let's look at the book of Luke, chapter 12. Now, some people, they would like to claim that the soul, after it dies, it goes to sleep, and that the soul is the same as the body. But Luke 12 will debunk that false doctrine taught by Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses. Look at Luke chapter 12. And then we'll see verse 4. I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. So notice right here, you're cast into hell after you're dead in your body. How about that? And the body, you'll notice over here, that's different. Uh, we're going to look at other passages. Let's look at the book of Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew, chapter 10. So notice over here that this heretical doctrine of the soul being the same as the body is false. And you'll notice also where in the passage it shows that there is eternal hell fire. It's not all the one and the same thing where hell is a grave and the soul equals the body. No, no, no. People who teach that they're teaching you heresy, actually. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. See that? The soul is distinguished from the body. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. How about that? Okay. You also notice over here that there is eternal torment. You'll notice that Revelation continues that idea. Look at Revelation, and then we're going to look at uh, chapter 19. Now look at this, Revelation chapter 19. Look at this eternal torment. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with them which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. See that? Remember, the people who received the mark of the beast are cast into fire and brimstone forever, right? Now look at this. And them that worshipped his image, these boasts were cast alive into a lake of fire. See that? Burning with brimstone. So notice over here at Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 that this is the same place where the people who receive the mark of the beast are cast with the false prophet and the beast. The lake of fire is not annihilation according to Seventh-day Adventist and Jehovah Witnesses. Now look at the next part. Revelation 20. You'll notice that verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be what? 
tormented day and night forever and ever. That matches word for word, torment forever and ever, fire and brimstone, with Revelation 14 that we looked at earlier. So there is no doubt over here that there is such a thing called eternal torment, and that is very much distinguished. Eternal torment, that is very much distinguished, and that is totally different from the false ideology propagated by Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses, that once you're in the fire, the lake of fire, you're annihilated, or that soul and body is the same. That is ridiculous, and that is false doctrine.